3D design for 3D printing bonus tutorial. If you've been struggling with constraints and dimensions, this one's for you. This video is part of a series on learning 3D design for making custom 3D printed parts using a free Onshape account. The playlist for the entire series is linked in the description. When I was making the earlier videos, there was a steady stream of comments of people who were struggling with constraints in their sketches. So today we take a deep dive by designing something simple and trying to cover them all. The whole way through this series, we've talked about making sketches black and fully constrained as opposed to blue elements that can be dragged to change both their position as well as their size. By the end of this video, it should be clear why that's important. And to demonstrate this, we're gonna design an adapter for a main board. Typically, these look quite simple when they're done, but getting the holes in the correct location relies on very accurate geometry. So into Onshape, and if you like, you can come to Create and then New Document. But for me, I'll continue working on the TT Tutorials doc, which is linked in the video description. I'll now come down to the lower left, click the plus, and go to Create New Part Studio. And then after the new tab is created, I'll right click on it and rename it. To start, I'm going to create a new sketch, draw on the top plane, press P for plane to hide them, and then N for normal to spin the camera around. The first thing I'll sketch is the outline of the main board, and for that I'm going to use a center point rectangle. I'll anchor this from the origin and then draw a rectangle in roughly the right proportions. The exact dimensions don't matter at this stage. My second click will complete the rectangle. I'll now draw the mounting holes for the main board by using the circle tool and drawing them in their rough positions. Again, I'm not too worried about exact positions or alignments at this stage because we're going to get that perfect later on. Now that this is done, we have a rough approximation of the main board that we're recreating. However, you'll notice that all elements of the sketch are blue and that means they're unconstrained. That means that while we might have a rectangle and four mounting holes, there's numerous ways the geometry could be interpreted and if we try and 3D print it now, it will most definitely be wrong. So we need to constrain our sketch and in this video, we aim to briefly cover each of the constraint tools available. The first one we're going to cover is the equals constraint and I'm gonna use it to make all of the circles the same size. If I click on their perimeters one at a time, I can then come up and click the equals constraint and this will make their diameters match. If I now hover over one of the circles, we can see that the equals constraint icon appears nearby, confirming the constraint. So let's press D for dimension and use it to add a measurement to one of the circles. We'll see that since they're all set to be equal in diameter, as soon as the value for one changes, the value for all of them will adjust. Alternatively, you could dimension each of these circles independently, but if you then need to make a change, it's going to take a lot longer. Because of this, constraints are very efficient. The equals constraint doesn't just work on circles, it will work on most geometry, for instance, these two lines. Let's add some more dimensions to the outside, starting with our overall width of 160 and our overall height of 95. These mounting holes are obviously not in the correct position but if we look at the dimensions provided for the main board, we don't actually have it written anywhere how far in from the edge they should be, so we have to infer it. But there are some dimensions given, such as this 84.2 for the vertical spacing between these two holes. The lower right hole is also dimensioned as 151.3 from the left-hand edge of the board. So with our dimension tool, we'll click the left-hand edge of the board as well as the center point of this mounting hole, and this will move it into the correct position. Let's now add that vertical dimension between the two holes on the right hand side, getting us one step closer to the final position, although after we input the dimension, we can see it needs adjustment. It's perfectly acceptable to drag things into a visually better position before we fully constrain them with constraints and dimensions. So we'll do the same for the upper right hole, which should be much closer to the corner. Since they're blue and unconstrained, I'll also click and drag the other two mounting holes into their rough positions. Looking at our source diagram, it seems the upper two holes are horizontally in line with each other, and the lower two mounting holes are horizontally aligned as well. We have a constraint tool for this, and it's called horizontal, and there's a similar one called vertical. We'll click horizontal for our application, and then we click the center point of the two circles, and you can see they're locked horizontally to each other. Let's repeat the same process for the lower two circles. 
As you might have guessed, Vertical works exactly the same way, locking elements to be vertically aligned. These tools don't just work on center points. For instance, we can force a line to be either horizontal or vertical by applying the constraint, and it doesn't matter which order you click the tool or the geometry. Every now and again, a horizontal or vertical constraint won't work as you expect, such as here where I'm expecting horizontal, but instead it goes vertical. And that's because if we look in the top right, our viewport is rotated 90 degrees to the side. And to fix this, we can click on the arrows at the top to spin our camera back to the correct orientation. Let's collect some more dimensions from the drawing and apply them to our sketch, such as a 97 millimeter width between the two upper holes. Once again, we can drag any blue geometry to get it visually into position. At the moment, we're kind of halfway there because the holes relate to each other, but not the outside of the board. So let's switch back to our diagram and we'll observe that the vertical distance from the edge of the board is the same as the horizontal distance from the edge of the board for each of these holes. Rather than dimension all of these holes the same, the most efficient way to do this is to use construction lines. We can click on the construction icon in the toolbar to toggle construction or use the keyboard shortcut Q. Toggling construction will also work when you're halfway through drawing any geometry in a sketch. We can see here it turns from a solid to a dotted line. I'm going to snap this construction line vertically to the outside of the board and then draw a matching horizontal construction line from the center point to the outside of the board again. If I then reapply an equals constraint for these two lines, and it doesn't matter that one's horizontal and one's vertical, we'll see that the center point of the circle is equal to both sides of the board. Let's draw another construction line from the center of one of the lower circles to the edge of the board. Again, use the equals constraint, this time clicking on the line we've just drawn and making it equal to one of the construction lines we did previously. Instantly, you notice all of this is black, which means it's fully constrained, we can no longer click and drag it, and it's in its final correct position. There's still one unconstrained circle in the lower left, so let's fix that now. Looking at the source CAD, there's no specific dimension, so we once again assume that its distance is the same from the side and the bottom of the board, just like what we've drawn so far. So once again, we'll add a construction line from the center point to the outside of the board, and then apply an equals constraint clicking on this new construction line, and then clicking on any of the other construction lines we have so far. And once we zoom out, we can see that the sketch is completely black, and that means fully constrained. There's only one way to interpret the geometry, and that's the way that matches our source diagram, which should ensure that our sketch is accurate. When I was using this main board in real life, I just needed to extrude some bosses on the flat panel to mate up with the board. But in this video, we'll make more of a frame to go underneath so we can explore more constraints. To continue, I'm going to start a second sketch. I'll draw on the top, right in line with my main board outline. I'm gonna start with a center point rectangle, press Q to toggle it to be a construction line, and then click somewhere on the outside. I'm now gonna draw a circle in each corner, select them all and make them equals. I'm now gonna draw a line joining up the top of this outer frame. Now obviously we don't have a smooth transition here and that gives us a chance to try out the tangent constraint. We click on the circle, we click on the line and that's gonna make sure that the transition between this line and this circle is as smooth as possible. I'm gonna come over to the right and do the same thing and we've got ourselves another good looking junction. This doesn't just work with straight lines, you can also use it with arcs. A tangent constraint will make the junction smooth between them. Let's now try the opposite constraint of tangent. I'm going to add one more mounting boss and then draw a construction line between these two circles. And that will allow me to demonstrate the normal constraint, which works the opposite way to the tangent constraint. Let's click the tool, click the circle, and then click the line. We'll do the same down here. Whereas the tangent ensures a smooth transition, using the normal constraint gives more of a 90 degree junction at that point of the curvature. Let's draw a second circle here that would actually be the cutout for a screw to go through and I've purposely drawn it offset and that will give us the chance to show off the concentric constraint. This constraint will ensure that any arc or circle share the same center point. So if I click on the two, the inner one will snap so now the circles share the same center point and have an equal distance between their perimeters. This works with both arcs and circles and any combination of the two. In most CAD programs, there's always multiple ways to achieve the same thing. And one of the constraints you'll use the most is called the coincident constraint. This basically ensures that two things touch the same point. 
I can get these two circles aligned by making their center points coincident. I click on one, I click the other, and you'll see that it locks together. This constraint is excellent for when you find a little gap. You can click on the two endpoints, and you can see that this shape is now shaded, which means its perimeter is complete. I'm gonna fast forward now and draw some of these same features, filling in more of the sketch. We're now up to speed, and we're gonna to start to draw the inside of this frame and use some more constraint tools. I'm gonna draw some more construction lines, and this time they're gonna act as center lines. Now this one here, I purposely drawn crooked, and I could use a vertical constraint to fix it, but instead we're going to demonstrate the midpoint constraint. To use it, we click a line and then a point, and that point will be snapped to the midpoint of the line. Let's lock this end to the center of the circle too, and this portion is now black. We'll draw a second one of these, and as we hover over, we're informed that a midpoint is gonna be automatically applied since we're in the right spot. Time to create another three of these diagonal lines using a variety of techniques. The first way is to mirror it. You can see we're prompted to select a mirror line and I'll select my vertical center line. Now everything we click afterwards will be mirrored to the other side. The next one I'm gonna draw manually and this time make the line symmetrical but with a constraint. To do that, we come up to the symmetric constraint. Again, we'll click the center line and then the two objects that we want to be symmetric. The end effect is exactly the same as if we had mirrored the line to create it. Finally, I'll draw the last line and this time show an alternate use of the coincident constraint. If we click on these two lines, they're now gonna be forced to be perfectly in line with each other, even though they don't actually touch. Let's draw a diagonal line for the frame, and this will allow me to demonstrate our next constraint, which is parallel. We select this tool and then click one line followed by the second. The two lines will now become parallel, which means they will never touch and always have the same distance in between them at any point. One thing about constraints is that we can use them between the current sketch and other sketches and 3D features. So for instance here, if I wanna change the angle of my frame to intersect with this mainboard mounting hole, there's nothing to stop me from doing a coincident between the sketch that I'm working on and the previous sketch we did earlier. When I'm sketching, I can also just snap to existing geometry from other areas. And as always, there's the very handy use, also known as project or convert, and when you click, that will trace things from other sketches onto your current one. And here's another example of me using a coincident constraint between my current 2D sketch and existing 3D geometry. A similar constraint we haven't tried so far is called Pierce. And you can see here, I can use it to lock together two pieces of geometry that wouldn't necessarily interact otherwise. This mounting hole isn't connected to anything, so I will connect it to the rest of the frame with some straight lines. I'd like to tidy this up and I'm going to use the perpendicular constraint. And any two lines that you click on will be locked at 90 degrees relative to each other. You'll notice that we've done a lot of constraining but almost all of the geometry is still blue and unconstrained. And what's missing are dimensions. So let's fast forward to me adding the last one and we can see that everything is black and fully constrained. There's probably extra lines here that make things look a bit messy. In these cases, we can use the trim tool and anything we click on will be removed. Before we click, it will be highlighted in yellow so you know exactly what you're getting rid of. The good thing about this tool is that the endpoints of the lines are preserved, as we can see here with the white dots, and that means our constraints are preserved too. There's also a third state besides blue and black, and that's red for overconstrained. What this means is that we have dimensions or constraints that conflict with each other. In this simple example, our rectangle is both 140 millimeters wide as well as 150 millimeters wide. Obviously this is impossible, so one of these needs to be removed and our red condition disappears. Here's another example where this line has been set to vertical, but the two endpoints touch circles that aren't vertically aligned. On shape will show the icons for the constraints that conflict. For instance, we could take away the coincident from the end of this line to let it go straight down but really this vertical constraint is the problem, so we can click on it and then press delete on the keyboard to remove it. And the sketch is no longer over constrained. Sometimes when you're sketching, constraints will be automatically added when you don't want them. We can see here the midpoint constraint icon hovering near the mouse cursor. If you see this happening, simply move the mouse to another place and then apply the actual constraint that you're after, in this case, vertical. All this part needed to complete it was a series of extrudes to various heights, a very functional part made accurate thanks to constraints and dimensions. 
That's it for this one. Hopefully we've now fleshed out enough detail for the people who requested it. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy designing parts for custom 3D prints. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.